So, vitreous, especially in relatively younger patients and myopics, while it is degenerated, but sometimes it quite, can be quite tenacious and maybe little difficult to cut. So, at the moment, I am using a cut rate of around 8,000 cuts per minute and vacuum of six, 600. So, if you can see, uh, the vitrectomy in such cases is not very difficult because we are, as of now, we are very far away from the retina and most of the retina is attached. Uh, vitrectomy may be little difficult once you go in the area where the retina is detached because the retina tends to flutter. So, in such cases, usually I would do the vitrectomy first in the area where retina is attached and then go to the areas where retina is detached. Vitrectomy is very important in these cases. You have to do the complete vitrectomy. Uh, in other eye, is there any predisposing lesion? Dr. Nawajis is the surgeon uh, uh, who is assisting. Yes, sir. And Dr. Nawajis just informed me that there is a single horseshoe shaped tear in the other eye at 12 o'clock. Uh, we plan to laser that uh, tear tomorrow. Uh, in this eye, it is almost uh, big tear or giant retinal tear. Yes, sir. So, you can see the moment I came to the area of detached retina, the retina started to flutter. So, I left, I have lifted my foot, uh, foot, uh, foot pedal a bit so that vacuum is lesser. So, as of now, it is around 230. So, that is a very important thing youngsters must take care when they are doing vitrectomy, especially in the area. So, you can see this is the tear uh, which is present temporally. I hope you can see it clearly, sir. Yes, yes. Like Dr. Vinod is demonstrating, it is very essential to remove the vitreous uh, attachments around the tear, especially the horns and the posterior margin also if it is attached there. So, at times in uh, once you implant the IL, the visualization may be little bit challenging, but with vis wide field systems, usually we don't face any issues. As you can see, now I am seeing through the aphakic area of the pupil and we are removing the peripheral vitreous as much as is possible. So, usually in fresh cases, I usually do not indent and remove the, shave the peripheral vitreous. Uh, in a short while when we complete our fluid air exchange, then I'll show you, I'll be doing peripheral vitrectomy under air, that is interface vitrectomy. So if you see, we have removed majority of the vitreous uh, from all around, uh, only the little bit around the ora serrata is left. So that is in fact the most difficult part to do. Even uh, the tear is free of vitreous now. So, since the patient is high myope and it appears that PVD is present, mm -hmm. I'll still doubly check it with the help of Tramson alone once. Tramson. So, you just need a little bit of Tramsalone at the posterior pole, just a few crystals over the disc and then we go again, go in with the cutter. So, if you notice the eye is very, very high, uh, long and my cutter is 
facing some difficulties in reaching in the macular area. This pre flowing tricot crystals indicate that there is no vitreous there. The PVD was probably always already present. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So if you can see a major, large majority of the crystals flew off, but some of them are sticking to the posterior pole. So in this scenario, I'm suspecting there is a vitreous crisis. So we'll go to the high magnification with the help of a contact lens. So can you see the posterior pole clearly, sir? If possible, can you reduce the illumination slightly? Is it uh, better now? Yeah. now? So as I'm going closer to the retinal surface, you can make out the I can aspirate the crystals. They, re they reassure us that there's no residual vitreous on the surface of the macula. And one thing is very important, as you can see here, uh, there is a bit of island of vitreous which is there. So this is just the area of the macula. Uh, so fovea at the center, you can see perifovial. This can go on to contribute to, uh, this can go on to contribute towards the formation of ERM in the post-operative period. So once you aspirate it, now that risk is probably gone. And some, so there is PVD which is pre-existing and now we are sure that there is no vitreous crisis. So now we can go on to make a retinotomy and drain the fluid. Now we'll again go to the wide angle viewing system. So now if you notice, uh, most of this RD is temporal and choosing the site of retinotomy may be a little tricky because normally we would make it on supranasal side and uh, this is the maximum height of fluid, but then again, it will be too close to macula on the temporal side. So I would like uh, make it probably somewhere over here outside the arcade away from the macula. So you just need to touch a little bit on the surface of retina. And once it is whitened, either you can open this opening with the help of cutter, or I will be using directly the uh, extrusion cannula, that is the soft tip cannula. So once you touch it with the help of soft tip, this automatically opens up. Uh, can we go to air, please? So you see it has already opened up. I have already switched on the air. And you will very shortly see that air coming in the vitreous cavity. So. See that again. 
understand it. So once you switch, go on to air fluid exchange, at times the visualization may be problem because there are flexes, lots of them because of the air, but you just have to be patient. Once most of the vitreous cavity is occupied by air, these reflexes go, tend to go away. So we are just drawing over the surface of the disc and our vitreous cavity is now completely replaced with air. So I'll just go ahead and do my peripheral, complete my peripheral vitectomy. So you can see uh, skirt of peripheral vitreous, which is there. This is interface vitrectomy. You know, with the instrumentation and visualization system, the things has become much better. Earlier, when, when there was a uh, visualization system was not better, we never used to reach that area. Or if sometime we have to go, we have to use the depression. We used to depress and then used to do the vitreous space even. So technology has improved a lot of comfort. So you can see we we are doing vitrectomy right at the aura and whatever little vitreous is there we are removing that you have to screen the periphery but in my hope sometime it becomes very difficult to identify the small breaks it's very important to clear the area of the break from the anterior vitreous so that is what we are just doing So temporal and nasal periphery may be a little bit difficult to see with the help of MIVS because uh, the ports open inside the vitreous cavity and there may be shadowing. So one has to adjust the light pipe a little bit to see the periphery in the temporal and nasal side. So if you see, we have already completed our vitrectomy. We have done the peripheral shave and this is the tear. You can see it's ni nicely settled. And this is our retinotomy. So the, we'll proceed on to our next step, that is the laser photocoagulation. So most of these cases, uh, I prefer to do 360 degree uh, laser photocoagulation. So we'll start from the inferior periphery. So here, fortunately, the break is just short of a GRT. That is why Dr. Vinod has nicely managed it uh, the way he did it. But had it been a full GRT with a folded flap, then the drainage technique would have been different. I think Dr. Vinod can elaborate on that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we were expect 
expecting it not to fold on it to itself or slip behind so that's why we directly went on to air fluid exchange but uh, if you are expecting that it will fold on itself then in that cases we have to resort to this is a basically uh, press case where PFCL. the holding is not there otherwise sometime a pvr is there and the folding is there traction is there and it is big then we have to use the if you were expecting a folding of the brake then you would have had to dry it from right at the edge of the brake keep your green tip there rather than at the red knot okay so we done the temporal side now we'll go to nasal side so we'll have to change the hands So this is a pseudo fakic patient, but in fakic patients, sometimes it may be a little problematic to laser the periphery. Um, so in that cases, uh, those cases, these curved laser probes are uh, really useful. So why are you preferring to do a peripheral laser when there's a clear cut break, uh, which is there? So uh, what are sir, at the moment, uh, uh, sir, most of cases I prefer nowadays the 60 la degree laser barrage because when we do peripheral shave, if there is a very small break, uh, which is unidentified, it can uh, spoil the whole surgery. And my results uh, have been little better once I shifted to 360 degree laser barrage. So that's why I prefer to do 360 degree laser barrage in all, all my cases. You know, earlier when we used to be there, when the, the this thing has not come, we used to only laser the break and we used to get the good results except in the old cases so now once the the things has come as rightly we know they said some small perforation and all these things but do you think the giving a laser we know giving a laser will uh, prevent the redetachment or failure or all these things the pvr is still a factor no sir cases, huh? that is something we all the youngsters must remember uh, because a shortening to... of retina cannot be dealt with the help of laser. Mm -hmm. So if shortening of retina is there, then you have to deal with that rather than just keep on doing laser because we have to remember more laser we do, more shortening it will cause. Okay, so laser itself has a, uh, some disadvantages. Sometimes excessive laser uh, can also create a break. So that can also cause the detachment. That is the thing. So, so only if, the expert with titrated laser should be done. So if you notice, because the tear is large, I have done four or five rows. Uh, normally, I would do roughly around three rows. Uh, as you have seen all around, I have done around two rows. But in the area of tear, because it's a very large tear, I have done around four to five rows. And uh, there is no further fluid. So we'll just... Also, I noticed that the peripheral barrage laser, which you have done, is in a T kind of format, no? Uh, yes, sir. You, so, what is the reason for that? Uh, sir, basically, just in case there is a small missed break, these peri uh, radial extensions, they keep the fluid limited to one particular clock hour or two clock hours. Okay. Rather than, if we do not do that, then the fluid extends almost 360 degree. And we know that more is the fluid, more would be the momentum, and more are the chances it will break through the laser. So yeah. go, uh, doing these radial yeah. extensions prevent those things. Uh, this will prevent the uh, yes. retinal detachment progressing. And that is the thing. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll just go on to check the periphery ones. Can you give me? Periphery that? must be checked in the, these cases. But uh, in some, some time, you can't detect periphery. And later on, you identify the, at the time of. So this is something, again, which is a must in all cases of vitrectomy. Uh, you thoroughly check the peripheral uh, retina so that you do not miss any tears. So if you see, this is a very peripheral tear right at the aura serrata. And I have done the horns four or five rows. So it is almost like a GRT. And you can see there are no peripheral tears. We have checked the temporal half. Now we'll go to the nasal half. So you're indenting with which instrument? So this is a, a plug holding forceps, which is in the form of an L-shaped instrument. So, of course, we don't use plugs anymore, but this is what we have been using them for quite some time. They are blunt instruments, very useful for indenting. And because their end is L-shaped, you can indent a wide area with the help of it. So we've screened the periphery. You can see there is no other tears. 
so now we can go and uh, inject this patient with tamponade and uh, uh, i think we there's no need to put, inject oil in this case we can go ahead with the sf6 gas so this is a fresh detachment uh, with no pvr a single tear which is there in the temporal quadrant a gas should suffice in such cases so we'll do it conventional way so, so rohan uh, would you elaborate the study gas versus silicon oil in fresh cases gas is 25. as good as so that's what i said i was just ah, about that gas saves the patient of a second surgery and that's a definitely big advantage and uh, without pvr like dr vinod said the uh, results of gas are as good uh, i think even incidence of glaucoma is also less so now most of us have started preferring gas wherever possible wherever we can but yes when it is an old case there is a lot of pvr or multiple breaks especially going on to the inferior quadrant then you can go on and inject oil and i think as the uh, confidence of the surgeon builds up slowly you change over from oil to gas the regular follow up is very important in these cases so this is pseudo fake guy what precautions are you taking uh, that the air doesn't come in the ac uh, sir usually if uh, zonules are not uh... Uh, compromise the air wouldn't come into ac or if capsule is intact usually the air wouldn't come in ac but in this particular case uh, uh, after putting the oil we did not wash the ac uh, from vis viscoelastic so once all these steps are complete i'll just give an ac wash also yes clamp so i'll be using 25% sf6 a little expensive as compared to what someone would use 20% the advantage is that because we'll be using mivs there is always bit of leakage so this take care of the hypotony in the post operative period when so dr nawajish has no loaded 25% sf6 and she'll be injecting that so it is said that if you flush the vitreous cavity with the help uh, with around 33 to 34 ml of gas mixture it will totally replace the vitreous cavity with the gas mixture so we usually fill it with the help uh, inject with the help of 50 cc needle so from the infusion cannula right now the assistant is injecting gas a 50 cc syringe has been attached yeah. to it at the concentration which dr vinod said so i'll start removing the ports one by one they uh, as uh, dr vinod is finishing but we must tell there there are various complication can occur at the time of yes. surgery also with retina yes. like if you don't see any if the infusion cannula is blocked then you can a hypotony corridor detachment the beginner should understand all these things they should see the 360 degree while operating so that is one of the thing which we have seen when the people are doing that should be there the infusion cannula should be open and flow should be regular okay. that is the thing okay. so how are you ensuring this port is closed like you are trying to massage what else we want to say so, resident is doing it it's still leaking or something uh, so the uh, if it is leaking you can see the air bubbles coming and you can check uh, with the help of air putting on the surface of it you can it's see the coming. bubble okay you can go inject that So, so it has been 23g would have you close the ports a little differently or would have you uh, sir we have very low threshold for uh, putting sutures uh, if we feel that it is not closing with massage we uh, go ahead and put sutures but 25 gauge you just have to be little more patient a uh, little patience and uh, the ports usually will close once you give them massage just a little bit inject Uh -huh. So, how do you want to leave the globe at the end? I mean, like with the uh, sorry, I'll hypothesis. leave. Normally, I leave a little normotensive only, and neither hypertensive nor uh, hypotensive. 
So, if you put suture, there is always some bit of irritation. The patient will complain in the post-operative period. But if you look, uh, if you do not put suture, just maintain little patients and massage them well. You can see the eye looks absolutely quiet. The patient has undergone phaco emulsification as well as vitrectomy. The eye is absolutely quiet. The patients are very, very comfortable in the post-operative procedure. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll end the surgery with the subconjunctival injection. Very nice surgery, Dr. Vinod. Yeah, uh, we nice. are very nice surgery. Should, uh, and thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and in RP Center, we have uh, two units, one headed by the Dr. Pradeep Ventis and the Sorry Ajar. I am the Aapne na, ulta leta. Dr. Rajpal, who is the unit in charge, and Rohan Chavla and Dr. Parijat Chandra. Sir. So we have an excellent senior resident who, by the end of the one year, they are a very good, excellent Twitter retina surgeon because of the improvement. Thank you, Dr. Vinod. Do we have other panelists on Zoom? If they want to Ek ask case some hai, question. Are there any other panelists on Zoom? No. AV team, can we have the Zoom view, please? Any questions from the audience? Questions? So we don't have any questions. Time to hai, Mara. Kuch bolo. Thank you. Utho. I think we'll hand over to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Brilliant presentation and uh, demonstrated surgery by uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar. Thank you to our panelists. Moving on to the last session for the evening, which is subjected on plaque brachytherapy. I would take the honor to invite our esteemed panelists, Dr. Bhavna Chavla, Dr. Lomi, Dr. Sushmita Pathi, Dr. V. Subramani, Dr. Dhanabalan, and Dr. Megha Singh. Can we have the video, please? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. So we start our session on plug brachytherapy. And I'm joined here by Dr. Lomi, Dr. Dhanabalan, Dr. Subramani. Dr. Subramani and Dr. Dhanabalan are our team from the Radiation Oncology Department, Medical Physics at the IRCH. And uh, before we begin the surgery, we have a short presentation by Dr. Kusumita that will brief you about the case. This mic is not on. Every team, please uh, see the uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just brief about the case that which, we, which is being discussed uh, in the video session. He is a 57 year old male presented with chief complaints of diminution of vision in the left eye since three months, not associated with any pain redness. He consulted a local hospital wherein he was diagnosed as left eye choroidal mass, for which he was referred to our center for further evaluation. <laughs> Further, moving ahead to the ocular examination, the patient had vision of 6 by 6 in the right eye and left eye vision of 1 by 60, which was uh, further improving to 6 by 12 on refraction. Uh, anterior segment findings were within normal limit, having early IMSC in the left eye. On fundus evaluation, right eye fundus was within normal limit, whereas left eye fundus showed an elevated dome-shaped mass arising from the choroid in the inferotemporal quadrant invo just involving the macula with orangish pigment. This is an opto-CP picture of the left eye showing a mass which is around, uh, which is dome-shaped elevated with orangish pigments around two disc diameter away from the optic disc just involving the macula. This is the top cone image showing the same 
the ultrasonography of the uh, the same mass lesion which shows an apical thickness of 3.9 mm and a basal diameter of 10.2 mm uh, was noted on fundus autofluorescence uh, the clumps of hyper autofluorescence was noted correlating well with the orange pigments ffa of the left eye showed patchy hypofluorescence in the early phase with staining and leakage in the late phase icg of the uh, left eye showed hypofluorescence in the early phase with mild hyperfluorescence in the late phase the oct image of the uh, the, uh, the mass show, showed a uh, soft dome shaped uh, surface with subretinal fluid and a shaggy or uh, uh, with a uh, loss of uh, photoreceptors underneath it these are the baseline uh, imaging of uh, both right and left eye uh, macular oct angiography uh, 6 into 6 mm and optic now uh, angiography of 4.5 into 4.5 mm uh, which helps in further uh, 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 follow up of the patient the MRI image uh, of brain and orbit showing an hyper intense uh, lesion uh, at uh, in hyper intense lesion uh, in the t1 weighted image and an hypo intense lesion on the t2 weighted image um, uh, further on fdg pet scan uh, there was a focal uh, enhancing uh, fdg pet uh, with uh, with no other uh, any uh, uh, metastasis other uh, in the rest of the body so our final conclusion uh, diagnosis was left eye choroidal melanoma medium size with early imsc and we had planned uh, left eye plaque brachytherapy under uh, local anesthesia so uh, the video will be discussed by uh, by professor bhavna chawla ma'am okay thank you kusumita uh, for a very nice presentation so we'll start the video to show you how this surgery was done. So as you know, we have a separate dedicated OT for the plaque brachytherapy facility because this is a radioactive source. And here you can see this is how the source is kept in the OT under strict supervision of our team from IRCH, the radiation safety officer who manages uh, this aspect of the plaque. And uh, this is how the uh, plaques are kept in our OT. These are the batches which all of us have to wear. And here I would like to just pause a minute uh, to show you that this is how the dosage calculation is done. So as you saw in this particular case, uh, according to the dimensions of the tumor on ultrasonography, uh, it had a basal diameter of uh, 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 a little more than 10 millimeters and an apical thickness of 3.9. So according to that, uh, you know, the our target dose to the apex of the melanoma is about 40, uh, 80 grays. Uh, so therefore, according to that, the dosimetry planning is done. And we have with us over here, Dr. Subramani and Dr. Dhanabalan, who do this uh, planning for us, the dosimetry planning. So do you, would you like to comment anything or explain a little bit about this procedure? Yeah, just one minute. Yeah. Uh... I think uh, uh, this is what very important steps uh, when you are using a radiation treatment. Because everyone, everyone should know that radiation is like a double-edged sword. Radiation induces the cancer, radiation destroys the cancer. Anything more than 5% of the prescription dose will impact on the clinical outcome. So what is an important is that you know how we are actually calculating and delivering the dose to a particular area of interest. That's what very much important. So there are many ways, like a manual, how we are actually calculating. There are other ways also using imaging and you know the simulation. There are uh, different ways are there. So this is how we determine how much time that patients needs to go based on that, you know, the prescription dose. So this is a simple, you know, one of the, uh, the process what we are adapted initially. Now we are planning for, you know, the next advanced uh, the stages of treatment planning using that simulation based on the imaging. So this is what actually briefly. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, here, as you can see, depending upon the tumor dimensions, the plaque uh, requirement to remain in C2 was around 36 hours. So which means is that, you know, when you do the surgery after that, the patient has to stay in isolation for 36 hours because he has a radioactive material in the eye and he cannot stay in the normal ward as such with other patients. So here, the period of 36 hours was calculated on this basis. Now, moving on to the uh, actual steps of the surgery. So here you can see in the OT where the autoclave is kept and, you know, the plugs are autoclaved. Now, this is what I was talking, you know, the isolation room. There's a separate room that has been actually made, uh, keeping in mind all the radiation safety precautions that we need to take. And um, before the surgery, you know, we confirm the eye that, okay, which eye has to be operated. And then the patient comes into the OT for the actual surgery. Now, uh, at this point in time, uh, we always like to, you know, make the patient comfortable here. This is a choroidal melanoma. It can be done under local anesthesia, but uh, when it is a case of retinoblastoma, obviously we need help of uh, general anesthesia. So that's how then the patient is prepared. And the, again, then before the surgery starts, we confirm doing an indirect ophthalmoscopy, make sure we have the tumor dimensions and everything correctly. And uh, once the indirect ophthalmoscopy is done, we also confirm with an ultrasonography, a B scan, and uh, you have already seen the images of the B scan showing a dome shaped uh, choroidal mass uh, with the thickness. Now here again, I would like to pause a little bit here and show you what all instruments uh, we need uh, for this surgery. So here you can see that there's a dummy plaque over here. What do we mean by a dummy plaque? So a dummy plaque is actually uh, very similar to the actual radioactive plaque that we are going to use, but we cannot keep the radioactive plaque openly like this for such a long time. So we use a dummy plaque initially to be able to secure the exact position and placement of the plaque on the sclera to mark the points to anchor the sutures. So that is why these dummy plaques are used. So this one is not radioactive, but it is designed exactly like the original radioactive plaque. And uh, just a little word over the, about the sutures that we use over here. So we have the ethibon suture and the vicral sutures here uh, for uh, different stages of the surgery. So Dr. Lomi, would you like to add something over here to this, uh, the things that we need to keep ready for the surgery? Yes, uh, one one more thing which is very important is like uh, uh, the the dummy plug which is kept pre ready. The active plug have to be also be sterilized at the same time that so that when we are in a position to place the active plug, we are not we don't have a time to wait for the dummy plug uh, for the active plug to get sterilized and then to have autoclave. You know? so everything have to be pre planned and. And all have to be on a properly uh, sterilized uh, way. Yeah. yeah, that's a very important point. So other rest of the things are basically what we use routinely during eye surgery. Now, moving on to the actual steps of the surgery. So uh, here again, you know, this is to show you the dummy plaque. So as you can see, this is a notched plaque. You know, what do we mean by a notch plaque? We mean that, you know, because over here, the tumor is located quite posteriorly. So it has a little notch to, you know, allow for the uh, curvature of the optic nerve. So here you can see the steps of the surgery now. First, clean drape, and then, of course, begin with the surgery. The patient is nicely, and uh, the eye is nicely anesthetized. So we do a peritomy. And if you remember, we are operating the left eye, and the mass is located temporally. So we have here, we have the lateral rectus, uh, where we are putting these sutures. So uh, most of the time, many times, it, it all depends on the location of the tumor. In this case, you know, we'll have to disinsert the lateral rectus so that we can actually, you know, be able to access the portion of the sclera that is immediately above the tumor. We don't have to do this step in every case. This depends on the location. Sometimes the tumor is located, you know, in such a quadrant where we can do it between the two muscles. But in any case, we did that here. And again, you know, once so we do that here, you can see the ultrasound. So uh, I'll just like pause a little bit here. So now what we have actually done is that we have placed the dummy plaque uh, here. And uh, when we place a dummy plaque, you can see this, uh, this dense object over here. And you can see that there is a shadowing behind it confirming the place of the, uh, the plaque. So uh, here it is, you can see 
that this is the dummy plaque in position. It has gone right behind where we wanted it to. And here are the, the two eyelets. So we need to mark those two places where we are actually going to suture the main plaque onto the sclera. So there are two eyelets over here. One is superior, one is inferior. So a marking has been done. Uh, superiorly and then another mark has been put inferiorly and uh, now uh, once this has been done here you can see that uh, we have to be very cautious while putting this suture because the partial thickness scleral suture and we have to make uh, take all precautions that the sclera is not perforated now this is actually the radioactive plaque here which is being placed so uh, this is a very very important step we have already uh, secured the position using our dummy plaque we removed the dummy plug, the sutures were in place, and now we are putting the radioactive plug. So uh, we have to try to minimize exposure of the whole team to radioactive uh, 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 to radioactivity, which is why we try to be very quick with this uh, part of the procedure. So uh, Dr. Dhanabalan, anything, uh, you know, in terms of radioactivity, you know, you're a medical physicist, so anything you would like to add, you know, some comments? Hello, uh, and, uh, this is a uh, ruthenium 106. It is an electron emitting isotope. So it will be stopped in a few centimeter itself. So you can explain something like this is a ruthenium plaque, right? Yes, so there are different types of plaques which have different kinds of radiation. So how does this compare with the other kind yeah, of plaques? That, me, yeah. Uh, basically, as Madam said, so there are different kind of the radioactive material can be used for the plaque you know placement so in generally there are uh, different radiations like you know gamma rays and the beta rays are being uh, generally used in plaque brachytherapy i'm not going to go into uh, other details so this ruthenium 106 is called beta radiation if you look at the penetrability of the radiation is in terms of you know few millimeter not more than 15 you know mm maximum so if you look at that other kind of the radiation called uh, iodine 125 which is also possible to use for this kind of you know the plaque placement radioactive material that is basically a gamma radiation which requires uh, more shielding and it has that you know capability of penetrating little bit more into the you know the tissue so these are that you know very important uh, things but when we are as madam, madam rightly said when you are placing that plaque as a surgeon what are the precautions to be taken is that the time, distance, and shielding. This is what major important principles in radiation safety are protections to the personnel who are operating the case. So how soon you are able to do the surgery, that much of radiation you will receive less. And how far and how close, that is also important. That is, you know, inverse square law. If you keep your distance double, that radiation exposure also less, you know, four times. And similarly, that shielding material is important, but in case of this kind of radioactive material, in terms of mm only it will reach it will not reach to in a centimeter so it is absolutely safe in handling this kind of radioactive sources so this is what very much important precautions as a surgeon during that you know surgery what are the radiation safety precautions to be taken from? thank you thank you very much so you know there are iodine plugs and i know that in the us entire us the iodine plugs are being used and over there the surgeons who are operating in the operating room they're actually wearing those you know lead shields apron. lead yeah, yeah, lead, yeah, apron. yeah exactly. lead aprons while they are performing the procedure but here because we are using ruthenium plugs and this is a beta radiation yes. we are not as much uh, you know exposed yes. as uh, the surgeons who are using the iodine plugs are so therefore we we just have those batches that we wear during surgery you want to elaborate a little bit about those batches yes yes so this is very much important again it is a radiation safety when you are dealing with radiation one must understand or in, and to determine how much radiations we are actually incurring during the procedure so there is a limit in every year as a radiation professional or worker one should not you know the exceed that maximum threshold of 20 millisievert in a year but in general, even for, you know, the heavy radioactive material handling professional also will not reach to that level, provided if they are, you know, optimally utilizing the radiation in operation. So that uh, the detector, how much radiation one is actually, you know, received is being called TLD, thermoluminescent dosimetry. The dosimetry means dose measurements. The personally, those who are involving in the procedure needs to wear 
that you know the two kind of uh, you know the dosimetry personal dosimetry one is in the wrist because when you do the surgery it is close to that you know the source so how much your hands are receiving the number one number two that you know the chest in uh, another one one more place where that you know usually we used to wear is a chest where another uh, one uh, tld needs to be placed that will give you that you know the whole body exposure on an average so these you know the doses are need to be sent to that ar atomic energy regulatory board in three months once you will replace that another uh, new one and then you will be, you will be able to see that what is the average maximum dose you received in a year which is within the tolerance of you know the radi radiation professional staff who is operating or anything exceeding so this is what actually an important point and the dosimeter is important uh, you know to understand how much radiation one has been received thank you so that's a very very important part of our uh, uh, surgery to understand how much exposure to radiation we all are having and to make sure that that is reduced to the minimum so now moving on with the surgery you here you can see that the sutures have been, are being tied this is a radioactive plug as i told you now this is being anchored nicely and you can see that uh, you know you can see this is the anterior edge of the plug so this plug is about 21 millimeters in diameter so it is going right up to the back of the eye and it is able to cover the area of the choroidal melanoma completely so as i told you that the dimensions of the choroidal melanoma were around 10 millimeters in basal diameter so therefore this plaque is nicely covering all of it uh, so that the whole uh, tumor can receive the desired radiation dose so again this is now uh, just the uh, yeah so this is an important thing here i would just pause a little bit and tell you that you know you, if you remember we had disinserted the lateral rectus and therefore now you know we have to use the hang back technique so that we don't lose the muscle because at the time of plaque removal we will be needing this so dr lomi you want to comment anything on this step uh one thing like uh, when you're doing this handbag technique, you have to be careful. You have to be having extra uh, length that can be pulled out during the, during the removal of the plug. If it is placed very short, then while uh, removing the plug, there can be entangling uh, of this uh, and difficulty of removal of the uh, active plug. That's, that's one important thing. And while removing also, you have to be careful because if my mistakenly you have cut this uh, the anterior part, then you would be difficulty in searching for the the the, the remnant uh, that uh, letter rectus muscles. Yeah, so like he rightly said, this is very important. And as I mentioned, this is not always needed for every kind of plaque surgery. It depends on the location of the tumor. Sometimes you can easily pass the plaque between two muscles and you really don't have to disinsert. But this is one particular case where the tumor was temporal and therefore we had to do this procedure on the lateral rectus. Sometimes uh, yeah. sometime you have to disinsert or uh, resect the left. Oblique muscles also. When you have to go back quite far and that there's obstruction by the oblique muscle, sometimes you have to sacrifice and resect the oblique muscle also in order to position the plug in the in the idle location. Yeah, and one thing I would like to add here is that you know that these are malignant conditions. So we're actually by doing these procedures, you're actually aiming for tumor control. And uh, here it is the life of the patient that is at stake, not just the eye and the vision. So therefore, even if you have to sacrifice a muscle or at some point in time, you do feel that there are some complications that are unavoidable, you may have to still go ahead with them considering that, you know, what your goals of this surgery are. So um, this is a little bit about the muscle. And then of course, the last step here, we are just closing the conjunctiva. So you can see how this is being done. Um, how, it, how did the video just turn off? So because I also wanted to show you the way the... I think we were here, right? Yeah. So this is a step about carefully closing the counting timer. So the reason why we could not show it live to you 
is because we didn't have the live transmission because we have a separate plug bracket therapy OT uh, being a radiation procedure. So we could not uh, show this to you live, but this is a recently recorded case that we are showing. And I also wanted to show a little part about the, uh, the removal of the plug. It's a few seconds. I think it will come after this. So as I mentioned to you that in this particular case, it was for 36 hours that the patient had to stay in the isolation room. So that is why uh, we had to, you know, keep the plaque in C2 for 36 hours. The target dose was uh, supposed to be around uh, 80 grays. So this is at the end of the surgery. This is our whole team. And I would like to acknowledge all the faculty members, our radiation oncology faculty, radiation physicists. We have Dr. Subramani, Dr. Dhanabalan with us, and all our very hardworking senior residents, Dr. Kusumita, Dr. Neha, Dr. Manu, our junior residents, Dr. Antriksh. Forgive me if I've missed out a few names, but I uh, express my deep felt gratitude to all of you. We all work as a team and we are very proud of our results. Thank you. Is there any questions? Any questions or, or any, anybody? Any questions? Anyone from, from the, the audience? audience would like to ask any question? Um, can I ask a question, please? So, ma'am, we have two questions in the chat. Yeah. Can we zoom it a little bit, AV team? Which suture are we using? Yes, uh, there's a question from the, uh, Dr. Anita. Yeah. Yeah, so, ma'am, hi. So, good to see you. And yeah, one thing I want to mention here, the highlight which I really missed is that this is a made in India plaque. And yeah. this is actually something that, you know, again, we are very, very proud of. Earlier, we were importing plaques, ruthenium plaques from Germany. But now BARC has taken this initiative to provide us these made in India plaques. So we are using them and we are having very good outcomes. So they're the same ruthenium plaques that we were importing earlier from outside. Uh, and uh, Dr. Subramani, you want to add a little bit about this new initiative yeah, that, yeah. I think yeah. the, the cost effectiveness. Yes. Uh, see, in order to spread out the program throughout the country, this is a really a very great opportunity what a BRC has developed this uh, radioactive source. Mm -hmm. If you are purchasing the same source from the Germany, it is around costing uh, about 10 to 11 lakh. Whereas uh, this source is going to be costed uh, in 50,000 50, to 55,000. So they also given initially the free of cost for starting the people. So I think this is wonderful, you know, uh, the, the tool cost effectively what we have been developed in uh, BRC, Make in India program. I'm sure that uh, all the surgeons, if you are able to really make use of it, it will be really, you know, useful and, uh, you know, helpful. Regarding your question, so we have three sutures, 5-0 ethibond, 6-0 vicryl, and 8-0 vicryl. So the 5-0 ethibond is used uh, to anchor it to the sclera. The 6-0 vicryl is used for the muscle, and the 8-0 for conjunctival closure. Dr. Yeah. Nita, do you also have plaque at your center? Yeah, we just got the plaque, and as Dr. Subramani said, we got it free of cost just before COVID. And then thanks to COVID, uh, it degenerated and now we have to get a new one. And we're just about to start. So I'm really interested and I'm going to ask you maybe some stupid questions like, does the dummy plaque come with the ra radioactive plaque when you order it? I... Yes, yes. They supply it together. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that was a really good demonstration, and um, I'm hoping that we can also use these made in India plaques. We're also very excited to be starting a plaque brachytherapy. I think it's a really important addition to treatment for retinoblastoma. So yeah, and yeah. now you know we are also finding you know the like the indications for plaque brachytherapy are also expanding now. Uh, you know to incorporate other tumors like. 
uh, apart from retinoblastoma, which is a pressing need, apart from that, like uveal melanomas, then even benign tumors like hemangiomas and ocular surface tumors like OSSN. So, I mean, you know, the more you start using it, the mm. more you find that there are more and more indications where people can really benefit from it. So I think it was something that was really, you know, uh, very badly needed. And now that it has come, we're all very excited. So I hope you have a very good team there to support you because an ocular oncologist by themselves uh, cannot do anything as far as this procedure is concerned. We are very ably supported by our radiation oncologists, our medical physicists and the whole team. So uh, wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further questions from the audience? Any concluding comments, Dr. Dhanibalan? You've been very quiet. Since the sources is uh, decaying, we have to replace it uh, once in three years, something like that. So we have to reorder and we have to get it back. And initially, the treatment time will be very less. And later on, uh, due to its source decay, uh, the treatment time will be more. One thing I would like to add, uh... The indication for ideal case is very important. We can't choose randomly any melanoma case come, you, got, you have to put a plug that's not lighted. It's a very critical decision you have to take in every aspect, whether what will be radiation dose uh, the sclera will receive, or that uh, another th the thickness of the tumor, apical thickness of the tumor. It's very important uh, while deciding and what is the largest basal diameter. You you have to put a plug in in, in a in a in a single uh, focal area only, not a multifocal tumors are there. So unifocal only unifocal lesions should be there. So everything every aspect have to look uh, taken in, in, into account before going for the uh, this plug bracket therapy. Yeah, so case selection is extremely important. Especially in our scenario, you know, we get many advanced cases of uveal melanoma where we cannot offer them plug, and then you know we have to go for upfront enucleation. So like, you know, uh, it's very like only the medium size uh, tumors or the smaller size tumors that will, you know, benefit from this kind of uh, procedure. And uh, also the other thing is the good thing is that at RP Center, we are providing this treatment free of cost to the patient. We are not charging anything. So I think that's a very huge uh, benefit for, you know, especially for a country like ours, where these kind of facilities are not routinely available. Very few specialized centers have this. So a patient who comes from very far and gets this treatment free of cost, it's a real blessing for them. So I hope that, you know, this will continue. And earlier, earlier, you know, these the, we used to procure very expensive plugs from Germany and they used to cost us a lot. Though we were not charging the patient, but the Institute had to pay the price for that. But now with the BARC initiative, you know, I mean, they are, they are providing these plugs free of cost. They want that they should be promoted all over the country. More and more people should be able to use them. And, you know, being a made in India plug, we're all very proud of this initiative. So if there are no more questions, then probably we can close the session. Wonderful. Excellently performed surgeries and brilliantly demonstrated surgeries by our esteemed group of speakers. Thank you and congratulations. Thanks to our esteemed panelists for moderating this session. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bhavna, Dr. Lomi, Dr. Dhanapalan and Dr. Subramani for the fantastic session. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we come to the end of 55th Foundation Day celebrations at Dr. RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned from each of the sessions that was especially curated for you all. I would request our panelists to please come forward for an e-group photograph. Let's have a huge round of applause for our panelists and for the wonderful sessions that have been planned since morning and since last three days. Surely, surely. So let's have the senior residents join in for the photograph. So let's have you all join in, guys. What are you waiting for?
So do I need to send a formal invitation to all of you now for a photograph as well? <laughs> so let's have all of you here on stage for a photograph, guys. And let's have a huge round of applause for the entire organizing committee who has planned, successfully planned and executed this four day conference. May please welcome Dr. Tityal on the stage, Dr. Namrata, who have been tirelessly working day in and day out for. Let's hear it for the entire organizing committee. So I welcome Dr. Namrata, Dr. Tityal, and the entire set of esteemed doctors with us. So let's have a huge round of applause for the successful conclusion of the 55th Foundation Day Celebration 2022 at Dr. RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. So let's say cheese. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the entire organizing committee, I would like to thank all of you for your precious time and for being an amazing audience. With this, this is your host Diksha Raina signing off for the evening. Until we meet next time, till then stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.